Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Sewell Chan, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom, The Texas Tribune. We cover state government, politics, and public policy right here in Texas. I'm thrilled today to be here in conversation with Margreta Vester, an icon in global digital security and someone at the forefront of the European Union's efforts to protect global consumers from the perils of unregulated technology. Previously, the EU's Commissioner for Competition, Commissioner Vestager is now the EU's Executive Vice President with responsibility for a Europe fit for a digital age. Commissioner, thank you for being here, and congratulations on being inducted into South by Southwest's Hall of Fame. Well, thank you very much. It is, it's great to be here, and really happy that so many of you made it towards the change of times. Let me, let me begin by asking you about um, a little bit about the course of your career and how you decided to focus on digital services and the digital economy. You know, we're of a generation where we are going to see generations where that have only grown up in the digital age. I'm curious about how you got into this space and what you think about those future generations. Well, what gets me out of bed in the morning is, is uh, the fight for equal opportunities. And having seen how big tech has used success to close the market space, that has been one of the driving uh, forces for what we have done for the last, yeah, soon to be 10 years. Uh, because if everyone is to have an equal opportunity of making it, of attracting investors, well, then you need to know that you can get to the market. And if the market is closed, if, you, if it's not your ideas, your hard work, your ability to attract investors, that makes you success or not, then I think we have something to do. And what I have seen over these years, not one, not two, not three finalized Google cases, now we have a fourth. We've had Apple cases, Facebook cases, uh, Amazon cases. Uh, it all started before me with a, with a Microsoft case, and we have open Microsoft cases now. We see that this idea of, of market power uh, sort of closes in on what is fundamental in an economy like ours, which is that you can make it to the marketplace. Is scale an inevitable consequence of innovation? Well, I think what we have seen the last sort of 10, 15 years is a dramatic change of, of market dynamics. Obviously, network effects, the effect of, of data, the more you have, the more successful you will be, that changes market dynamics completely. And, and this is also why we have had the need for uh, another tool, uh, as we see it in, in Europe, a tool to make sure that with size comes responsibility. Uh, because we have seen so much misuse of market power uh, that it is important because otherwise we are afraid that innovation will just slowly but surely close down. The European Union has enacted a number of critical um, acts of legislation that really affect global consumers, including consumers here in the US. Things like the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, and the AI Act, which has been billed as really the first comprehensive AI legislation in the world. Can you walk us through what these measures do and how they'll impact consumers? So our basic thinking is, is quite simple. Uh, technology is here to serve people, and uh, if you trust technology, it's much more likely that you will actually embrace it and make the most of it. And, uh, and what we have seen, for instance, in, in the digital services that every one of us uses every day, is that it's not a given that they can be trusted. So the Digital Services Act will make sure that if you are a huge service provider, uh, it could be social media, uh, that you actually assess, are there risks here that this service will be a problem for people's mental health? You know, Frances Hogan, she was the whistleblower who claimed that uh, Facebook cared more about profits than the mental health issues of, uh, of Instagram. Without having a position on that, that is exactly what they'll have to assess. Is it safe to use? And we care a lot about safety in physical products. Uh, are there chemicals in them that will affect us uh, in a carcinogenic uh, way? We have so far not been caring enough about risks with digital services. 
Uh, and also, in every European state, they would have you know, rules on, for instance, hate speech. So at a European level, we obliged platforms to have a way of figuring out whether they're carrying something illegal. Uh, so there is an obligation to have a system in place to take down, but if you have your post taken down, you can complain about it. And if you're not happy because of freedom of speech uh, concerns, then of course you can go to the courts uh, to say, well, this is, this is not how things were supposed to be. So it's really to, to protect um, while at the same time also enable freedom of expression. And there are special provisions for, uh, for youngsters uh, and for kids to make sure that the below 13, that, that they are not there and seeing things that they should not see. And I think that is an increasing global issue, yeah. that uh, uh, we don't want the youngsters to be heard. The Markets Act, as said, very simple. Let's open the digital market for many more innovators to be able to make it out there. And for the AI Act, uh, if AI is being used when, when uh, when you're admitted to university, can you get a mortgage? Can you get an insurance? All these important life-turning events, if AI is being used, that you know that there is not a risk of you being discriminated. Because already in Europe, we've had the first scandals of AI being used for public services. Uh, that was uh, biased. Uh, a minister came down, a government came tumbling down, and obviously that undermines trust in, in the use of artificial intelligence. And there are so many great uh, things uh, and use cases of artificial intelligence, so we want to make sure that people trust it. Now, um, you were mentioning young people a moment ago. A few weeks ago, the Senate, um, the Senate committee held a hearing with the CEOs of big tech companies to focus specifically on youth mental health and the effect of YouTube, Instagram, and other platforms, many of them video platforms, on young people both in terms of addiction, but also in terms of child sexual abuse mm -hmm. and uh, engage in other illegal activities that were occurring online. This hearing, I was struck by how bipartisan the anger was, and yet there's been almost next to no actual action by the US Congress. Is this because of the political influence of big tech? Is this because of the kind of libertarian or free market ideology in the US? What do you attribute that to? Well, I, I find it really strange because I heard the same thing. This is something that we agree on, that kids should be protected. Um, so, you know, you know the US legislature uh, so much better than I do, but it is really strange that steps are not taken. Uh, I would find it strange though, is if for instance, Facebook is doing the risk assessment, they're addressing the risks while providing the services in Europe, if they would then say, oh, but we only do this in Europe, we only want to protect children in Europe because that is the law that you would not do the same thing in basically the rest of the world. So what is motivating the companies? Is it the resources that would be required to more intensively moderate? Is it kind of a somewhat of a cowboy mentality in terms of, you know, letting things go until you run into an obstacle? I think it's a mix of both. Uh, we have had issues with, with Facebook in some European countries, you know, we have 23 official languages, where they see things that are coming up on Facebook, which is obviously illegal, and you know, there's no one at Facebook to pick up the phone. There may be one person who actually speaks the language of, of the uh, country in question. And that I find to be, you know, such a, a cynical um, priority to say, no, we will not spend resources on this country knowing that Europe is one of the most important markets. You know, a lot of big tech is doing better in Europe than they do in the US. In fact, Europe is the single largest common market yes. for these digital products and services. Tell us a little bit about your approach to AI. You know, are we learning from the lessons of what was done in the 90s or not done in the 90s when the web was the dominant uh, form of digital innovation? Well, I don't know if we learned fast enough, but the good thing or the good news is that we learned together. Uh, we have a very good cooperation with our US counterparts. We see initiatives within the G7. Uh, we see interest in India and in Indonesia. So basically all over the world, there is a wish to learn uh, how to deal with artificial intelligence so that it's not a, an existential risk sort of, uh, on, on longer term, 
but also that it's not an existential risk for the individual, that I'm not being seen as the person that I am. That, for instance, um, if you use AI to sort of decode a, a 911 call, but can only really hear that there is a heart attack in a man, but not in a woman, then it's actually lethal, uh, the way that it's being uh, introduced. So, so there is a global uh, interest, there's a global uh, focus on, on how to use AI, because we all woke up to AI on our phones, uh, now a year and a half ago or something like that. Uh, of course, AI had been around for a very long time, but the fact that everyone was faced with it I think also made sure that the political interest uh, really, really, really increased. So we now have the presidential order here in the US, we have the AI Act in Europe, we have the G7 Code of Conduct. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on the developers to make sure that their technology is safe. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, when it comes to AI, what's the threat, how do you assess the threats of misinformation uh, and disinformation. I think a lot of us who work in the creative industries, including in journalism, are really worried about the possibility of deep fakes and kind of synthetic, you know, um, um, forgery of some kind, pretending to be someone, pretending to be someone's voice or image, and that proliferating kind of on an industrial scale, kind of ahead of humanity's or human consciousness's ability to process all that information. Um, are we heading toward a kind of information apocalypse? Well, I think humans have always been lying. I think that that, that is unfortunately who we are. Um, but the thing- Not right now, of course. <laughs> obviously not right now. Um, <laughs> but the thing is that I think the, the information apocalypse is that we stop trusting anything. It's not just the one story that someone thinks that we should believe or not believe, it's the fact that we sort of doubt everything that we see. And society is about trust, that I trust you to have good intentions, we know that here or there, there is indeed someone who would lie to us, but in general, that you can trust that society is actually there for you. That being undermined, what you're left with is then chaos. So I think it's absolutely crucial, both that there is a technological response so that we can see what has been made that is fake, but also that there is a journalistic response. I think the fact checking, the journalistic uh, efforts, the resources being put to it, many news organizations, they put real resources into fact checking. I think that is really, really crucial. But I don't think that it will work without a technological response that you can sort of see, is this actually fake? The, the watermarking, but also the technology that can look for fakes that are not watermarked. Commissioner, you often hear in the US the refrain that government will never be able to adequately regulate technology. A, because we got regulators may not have the technological sophistication or the same level of resources as the tech companies. B, because legal frameworks may not have been evolved enough uh, rapidly to deal with the here and now. Well, you know, what do you make of that argument and how do you in your regulatory process assemble the right stakeholders and make sure that you're consulting broadly before pushing forward decisions? Well, I think first and foremost that it's, it's legitimate that the people's representatives are not also tech uh, nerds or technologists. I think it's fair enough that people choose the people that they want to be represented with, and then they take decisions. Uh, the second thing is that we try to regulate the use of technology instead of what is actually the state of technology, because otherwise we would surely be, you know, always too late. The train would always have left the station once we got our ducks in order. So, for instance, the AI Act is focusing on the use of technology rather of this generation of large language models or this uh, trajectory towards uh, general uh, artificial intelligence. And that, of course, helps us some. And then also we try to do sort of more, I'd say, modern legislation. So giving room, for instance, to uh, a dialogue between the regulator and the companies in question. So instead of thinking we know it all, we have seen it all, which we obviously have not, 
uh, then saying, this is what we want to achieve. We have very hard tools in our toolbox of fines and, and what have you, but we also have sort of a regulatory dialogue that, that can be a conversation between a company and the regulator to figure out what is the good solution here. Because otherwise, I completely agree with you, we'll always be behind the curve. We'll never be there where it's relevant, uh, and we would always be, be at a risk of being run over by resources that we do not have. You know, sometimes we say with a smile that for every person in a case team investigating a tech case, there is a law firm on the other side. <laughs> wow, that's quite a disparity. But you know, there are some, um, also disadvantages to large scale. Yeah. Um, Commissioner, I'm curious a little, little bit about the geopolitics of tech regulation. You know, a lot of tech founders, of course, are themselves of immigrant origin, but it's true that most of the big tech companies have come out of the United States, whereas most of the regulation has come out of Europe. How do you balance those dynamics at a time when, you know, Western democracies are under great challenge including from authoritarian powers like Russia and China? Well, first and foremost, I take it very, very seriously when people claim that this is just out of spite or out of envy that Europe is passing legislation that is only directed towards US companies. Um, because this is not who we are. Equal treatment is, you know, one of our fundamentals. Um, and I think it's, you see it in, in some of the companies who would benefit from both the Digital Markets Act uh, and the, the antitrust work that we do. Uh, we have had US companies uh, complaining about other US companies, how business is done in Europe. Uh, I hope to see uh, innovative, uh, smaller US companies benefit from the market in Europe uh, opening so that we have more uh, innovation and more innovative products uh, in Europe. And I think it's also part of democracy that when sectors develop and are de facto shaping our future, that's the regulator can come in and say, listen, you do great business, you are so successful, for that we applaud you, but there also comes a responsibility uh, with that. Um, because otherwise our democracy is closing down as well. What about the geopolitical trade-offs? In particular in the US, you hear sometimes that we, that, the, that Americans are in a kind of geopolitical competition with China, especially on AI. And there's an argument that our companies need to be allowed to innovate quickly in order to stay ahead of state-sponsored or state-supported uh, AI innovation uh, in China. But I agree with that. Uh, I think that it's about to have full scale on innovation. Uh, and part of that is, of course, that there are you know, good use cases. Uh, in Europe, we have, in general, sort of quite large public sectors, uh, what we consider, you know, our version, our take on the welfare state. So education, health, uh, social benefits, uh, labor market, uh, all of that. And we would want, you know, as much innovation as possible for the use of the public sector of artificial intelligence in providing better public services. In doing that, you need to be able to trust it. So. For us, this is, this is not about innovation. The AI Act doesn't touch on innovation or on research. It's only when you put it into use that there will be a check. Have you actually good data uh, when you train this? Have you good data when you then test uh, what you have trained? And I think that's the balance here uh, because there is indeed a, a global competition. We also consider ourselves as systemic rivals uh, to China. Uh, because Europe is a democracy, just as well as a hardcore uh, economic competitor. When you think about global digital governance, what role does the EU have in influencing regulatory decisions made by other major economies, not just the US, of course, but also Canada, Australia, and also, of course, the world's rising middle-income countries, India, um, countries in Africa, uh, Brazil, Mexico, et cetera? Well, there's been a lot of talk about sort of the Brussels effects. <coughs> I think it, to some degree it sort of overshadows the innovation that comes out of Europe. We have a very, very vibrant uh, startup scene. Um, but it is true so far that Europe is a first mover 
both when it comes to privacy legislation and when it comes to keeping the market open and making sure that digital services are safe. What we see is that it inspires around the planet. You know, we have no ambition and we should not be a global uh, regulator, but it's inspiring to see that there is interest and uh, inspiration uh, to be had. India has passed privacy uh, legislation, California famously uh, also done that. And I think that's a good thing that we can inspire each other to take steps the same way. You know, one of the things that I, I always is puzzled about is that the US, who, who takes so much pride in the individual, in the American dream, in the right to bear arms, in, in all these individual decisions, that there is not a federal privacy legislation. Well, we don't have a constitutional right to privacy. Should we have one? Well, that, of course, is not for me to decide. It's just when you look at the US culture from the outside, when you see how much pride is taken in the, in the decisions of the individual, that each and every one should have the chance of making it, that, that privacy is not part of that equation. How do you reconcile, but on another related subject, how do we reconcile the US commitment to free speech, which is enshrined not only in the First Amendment, but in various kinds of judicial interpretations that really make it clear that hate speech is not illegal in the US framework unless it incites violence. How do we reconcile that with the European framework against hate speech? Well, you know, we also consider ourselves uh, as, a, as a union of, uh, of freedom of expression. Um, but that being said, not all expressions are legal. You know, it's, it's not legal to, to kill someone. One could say that's also an expression. Yeah, yeah, but mm, we don't like that. It's absolutely forbidden. You go to prison for a long time. Um, there are other things where we find this is actually not in accordance with the society that we want to have, um, hate speech being, being one of them. Of course, this is, there will be a gray zone here. We have, you know, excitement to violence, sharing of bum recipes, uh, child abuse, all of that obviously illegal. Hate speech is also more culturally bound so here, my guess would be that European courts will be uh, challenged to define what can you do and what can you not do. But since it is very important for us to protect minorities, uh, European states would all have uh, a ban of, uh, of hate speech. The European legislation only provides that technology companies would have a system actually to make sure that this is not just theory, but that it's real life that you are protected uh, against uh, violent hate online. Um, recently, the EU Commission fined Apple $1.8 billion for allegedly restricting app developers' ability to inform users about cheaper options to buy music outside of the Apple ecosystem. I believe the case originated with a complaint by Spotify. What's your response to Apple's argument, which is that the, the EU failed to demonstrate consumer harm, that um, you know, billions or hundreds of millions of people have benefited from having inexpensive access to streaming, and that you know, their platform is in fact neutral? Well, there are, uh, Spotify has not been on the Apple App Store for quite some time because they refused to pay the 30% the uh, fee. Yeah. Uh, but you have other music streaming services who are indeed uh, on the Apple App Store and then they pay the fee. And that, of course, is fine and good if you have choice. Uh, you can say, but I like the App Store services, I'm happy to pay the 30% uh, fee if you have choice. But you have no idea that that choice exists because your uh, preferred um, app cannot tell you that you can go to their website and subscribe without the fee you have to do a bit more in order to go there because you do not have the Apple App Store services, but you could be informed uh, about this uh, option actually existing. So we do think that, that millions of, uh, of citizens have paid too much uh, for their music streaming services. Does, so will Apple be required to allow <clears throat> other music streaming services onto its App Store without paying the 30%? they will have to allow for uh, music streaming uh, apps uh, to uh, tell that there is a cheaper op uh, option. 
uh, is called uh, anti-staring, and anti-staring is forbidden uh, as from uh, 7th of, uh, of March within the Digital Market Act, so in general, but also specifically for uh, music streaming apps, uh, you cannot say to, to someone, you cannot have a, uh, a link in your app, uh, you're not allowed to communicate with your own customers, because we take care of all of that to maintain the 30% fee. Will that have an impact on other Apple shared services, including Apple News and you know, um, uh, other products? Well, it may have an, an impact on all the competitors uh, to Apple News and, and other Apple products that people say, well, I'll offer my services in here. I may have a competing app. It can be a dating app. It can be so many other things. And then people have choice. Would I want to pay a service fee for being in the Apple App Store? Or would I more happily have the bit of trouble to go to the web page uh, of, uh, of the service provider and make my subscription there? Now, why did the Europeans make Apple um, adopt the USB-C protocol? Well... And what's going to happen to all our little firewire... Well, we were, you ports? know, one of the things that I think annoys a lot of not only Europeans is that drawer you have with all your different chargers and the problem of finding the one, you know, because obviously I have some old gadgets. I'm, I'm traveling with three different uh, chargers and then want to go into the US plug, obviously. And, uh, and that has been, you know, really annoying. So it's just to say, well, in Europe, there is a law. It is one charger. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, has global consequences. Which has global consequences. And one of the consequences is that we will get rid of a lot of uh, waste uh, when it comes to all these different charges, because you don't have to get a new one once you get a new, new gadget. Um, Commissioner, you've been, um, you're probably the best known global regulator, you're non-American regulator in the United States. Um, you have at times faced criticism, including from American leaders such as Donald Trump. In your previous role, when you were commissioner for competition, you took on companies like Google and Amazon. Donald Trump called you Europe's tax lady. <laughs> and, and said- but he also claimed to have met me, and I, I never. Uh, he also said, quote, she hates the United States perhaps worse than any person I've met. <laughs> what would a second Trump administration mean for digital safety and security in the U.S.? Well, obviously, there's a lot of things that are difficult to judge. Would, you, would you take a meeting? I don't think I have the ranking. I, I really don't think so. Uh, but other than that, when, when you look at the discussions among Republicans and, and Democrats, I think there is, here there is actually something that is somewhat bipartisan. Uh, that technology uh, should serve people, that innovators should have uh, market access. So I think it's, it's one of the issues that are not as divisive as, as some other issues. Obviously it will be really interesting to see what the Supreme Court, how it will come down on, on the question of, uh, of the laws on, uh, on free speech in, in two of the states. But I think it's, it's, a, it's an error that has still not been completely sort of captured in, in a polarized environment. So one of the free speech laws you're referring to is the social media law coming out of Texas, where we are right yeah. now. Do you have an analysis about whether US states should have that ability to um, have a say on social media companies' moderation policies? Well, I'm so not an expert. Uh, I have listened to people who are really experts in this, and, uh, and I think they also do not know how the Supreme Court uh, will come down on this. What I can say is that in Europe, we find that it is, it's legitimate in a democracy to say, if you are a very large online platform, you are de facto our democratic uh, infrastructure, you need to have a system so that states know, European member states know that what they have decided is legal or, or more likely illegal, that it's actually also reality in our um, uh, virtual lives. And that approach now, let's see uh, how it will play out. Of course, we do hope that it can serve as an inspiration for other jurisdictions, but it's, it's not for us to impose it in any way.
So Section 230, the 1996 law that kind of allow, exempts uh, platforms from civil liability, arguing that they're not publishers, is that being gradually undermined by both these lawsuits and the regulations that are coming out of Brussels? I don't think so. I think it's, it's a different matter because it's just, just, just to say that you need to have a system in place. Uh, and of course, most platforms, they have a system in place because they have their own terms of service. Everybody has signed up. Uh, you know, we have famous cases in the country I come from, Denmark, where we have a very relaxed uh, relationship with nudity. Not on Facebook, I can tell you. Uh, there is a, a famous book that cannot be shown on Facebook because it has naked women uh, on the front cover. So, you know, it's not that there are not moderating systems already based on the terms that we have all signed up for. So, so the step to say, well, you need to have a moderating system to make sure that what is actually considered illegal is also not carried. Uh, and of course, a lot of work is being done already when, for instance, it comes to child abuse, which is one of the saddest thing, I think, of our modern times, is that it's indeed going up, uh, I think, in, in most jurisdictions. How, but how can you regulate the kind of quantity and quality of regulation? You have companies like X, formerly Twitter, that have cut trust and safety teams. You have companies like Facebook and Google moving away from support for news publishers. In general, there still seems to be a very laissez-faire approach toward moderation. Is that, is that inevitable? Well, when it comes to, to X, we have an, an active investigation. Uh, because we have the suspicion, indeed, that they fail to have any of these systems in place. Uh, and if we find that they have indeed not done what they were supposed to do, they have hefty fines coming. Uh, and same goes uh, with, with the rest uh, in, in, you know, I have now this almost 10 years experience in antitrust cases. And I have seen repetition of illegal behavior. You know, the learning curve is, is not that impressive. Um, so, so I don't think that the new legislation will just be followed like that. And this is why the legislator has given us an enforcement toolbox. So you can give out quite hefty fines. In repeat circumstance, you can double hefty fines. If repeated, repeated uh, circumstance, you can get to a situation where you can actually order the company to be split up. And I, I think, based on my experience, that this is the kind of tools that you need to have. You cannot rely on voluntary goodwill, codes of conduct. You need to have more. Um, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about um, a little bit about kind of your personal experiences as as this um, as a regulatory leader. In 2021, you told Femina, a Danish magazine, that we're moving toward gender equality at work, quote, at a completely unacceptably slow speed. What has it been like for you having this truly extraordinary high profile career going head to head with these big companies, many of them led by men, and I bet often being the only woman in the room? Well, you know, one of the things I, I learned quite early is that even if you dress like a man, nobody's fooled. <laughs> they, they know very well that you're a woman. So I decided not to give up uh, on all the fabulous things about being a woman, uh, you, can, you can have, in my opinion, interesting clothes. Uh, you can have your hair in different ways. Uh, you don't have to express your creativity only through a tie. Um, so, so I thought, why not? <laughs> But of course, when, when I was younger, I, I felt the protection in, in not standing out. Uh, because the minute you stand out, of course, you also have much more hard uh, words and, and behavior coming at you. And, and we see that uh, a lot of women, they are actively being discouraged from taking uh, the word in public space because of, of what they get uh, on social media once they do that. Harassment, threats, uh, you know, really, really uh, tough uh, words is, uh, is, is everyday life for, for many women who has an ambition to be part of public life, either as a business leader uh, or uh, going into to politics or just public debate. 
And, and that is something that ought to be, I think, a common uh, ambition uh, to make sure that it is safe for women also to be in our virtual worlds. It was impossible not to notice that when the OpenAI board controversy occurred, you know, several female board members lost their positions. Now OpenAI has announced some new uh, board members, several of them are women. Is the fact that our global tech companies are so male dominated, is that related, perhaps is that related to their attitude toward regulation? Well, at least one can say that what we see is that if you have diversity in your leadership teams, you have a different approach. Um, I have, I'm serving in the commission now for the second time. And in the first commission, we were like 25, 30% women. Now in this commission, we are 50, 50. Wow. And not only has it changed how the commission looks, it much more colorful um, with a different presence. Um, it has also changed the atmosphere in the room. And I think it's, it's really just plain stupid that half the talent pool is not really being utilized. And it's not innocent. You know, we are up against thousands of years of culture of saying, no, women should be silent, women can go home. But it's just in modern times where we want to create the most prosperous, the, prosperous, uh, the, the best societies, why not take all those women on board? literally on board, because in many boards there are way too few women. Yeah. Mm. And in America, it would be hard to imagine, even now, hard to imagine a cabinet that was half female, a Congress that was half female, state legislatures, our 50 governors, um, corporate boards. Should we have certain expectations or standards like you know, Scandinavia, Scandinavia does with respect to female representation um, in legislatures and on boards? But when I was so much younger, I, I sort of, this idea of quotas was a bad idea. We would usually say, no quotas, that's for fish. <laughs> I, I, want, I want only to be promoted because I'm clever. Then I realized that we have had informal male quotas for hundreds of years at the level of 90, 95%. So it worked really well. <laughs> so I have changed my mind completely. I definitely think that quotas work. And, uh, and within the next couple of years, uh, you know, listed companies in Europe, uh, they will also have to get there where the underrepresented sex will need to be represented at least 40%. Uh, and you can guess who will benefit from that, because I think there are so few still in your boards where you have uh, at least 40% women. Um, as technology co continues to advance, there's growing concern about consumer data being sold to AI companies, about, um, pri about essentially commercial surveillance, about algorithmic bias, the privileges some people over others, and the concentration of power um, even greater than it is right now in the hands of a few tech companies. How can competition policy address those kinds of broader societal concerns, especially privacy, especially security, uh, beyond the broader uh, uh, market concerns? Well, we can do something. Uh, right now, we are working uh, I have the European responsibility for competition law enforcement, but we also have competition authorities in every member state. So we're working together to understand how will market dynamics change. Let's say we saw the first market dynamics, you know, dramatically change with the network effects, when you take it all, how data has uh, fueled all of that. So we're working intensively to understand how will market dynamics change. So we will be able to see what is a misuse of a dominant position because we think it will fuel all the bad behaviors that we have seen so far. But competition law enforcement is only one tool. Uh, we need our democracies to respond to all the threats that comes in order to benefit from all the promises of technology. Uh, just as well as we have legislation on environments uh, to keep our drinking water clean, we have legislation on the labor market for people to be able to work safely. 
uh, we also need, you know, this kind of legislation that we are passing now. And then within that framework, you know, the specific competition law enforcement, we can do our job to keep the market open because that is basically what is needed to make the most of technology, that there is this competitive drive to do the best we can. And speaking of the environment, does competition policy have something to say about the use of, you know, by crypto miners or by AI companies, cloud computing? These activities have giant consequences on the environment, including, you know, massive server and storage farms. Uh, they're out here in West Texas. They're using tons of energy and water and electricity. You know, what, what, what if anything, can be done about that? Well, what can be done about it is technological development. We need more advanced uh, semiconductors that are much lower in their energy use because right now, you know, technology is, the energy use is just going one way and that is up. Yeah. Also because people tend to think, oh, I better ask ChatGPT for a recipe for flapjacks, whatever they're called here, um, instead of just looking for a recipe. And then, you know, ChatGPT goes around the world, it takes, costs a fortune in energy. And the second thing is that, fine, if the data centers are fueled by energy that comes from solar power or wind farms, but that energy could still be used for something else. So we really need to challenge uh, the tech industry to be much more advanced in being much more efficient. One of the ways to go, of course, is to have decentralized AI so that you have a version basically with you on your phone that will work in a decentralized environment instead of having to circle the entire planet, because that is really what makes the energy use go crazy. Is part of the challenge that we as consumers want one-stop shopping, that we want, we don't want to keep and cognitively keep too many different companies in mind. We want the, you know, the idea behind X, right, is a, su is a super app that would allow all sorts of things from online banking to, um, and I'm old enough to remember when X.com was an online bank. Um, you know, is, 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 are we battling kind of consumer preferences for kind of simplicity even though we'd be better off with a pluralism of services and companies? But I, I think there's room for everything. I think there's room for some consumers who say, no, I don't want choice. I just want to pay the highest price potentially because I want to be in a closed environment. Mm -hmm. And other consumers who say, no, I want, I'm a curious person. Uh, I want choice. I want to see what is coming, what is better than what I have already, uh, which is why sort of, um, uh, open APIs, uh, the possibility to multi-home is absolutely essential. Um, but, but you see part of it, uh, Ukraine, despite being, being at a very aggressive uh, war, uh, you know, the, the, the Russian uh, invasion and aggression, they're still developing their tech uh, with a very high speed. They have an, a wallet, and in that wallet, of course, you can have the usual public services, but you can also vote in the European uh, uh, Eurovision, so a song contest, yeah. and you can support the military. So, you know, there are really some people who want to do everything in the same wallet. So there's also tools for digital democracy that would actually open the possibility of greater civic engagement. I think so, but I think um, the integrity of elections must always be the highest priority. If there is ever doubt that the electoral results can be uh, compromised by using technology, I, I would sort of say, well, then the integrity of the election is, is the highest priority. That makes sense. We're gonna turn to some um, uh, questions from the audience now. Um, the first, how can the, and uh, just a reminder that you can go to your South by Southwest Go app and click engage on the event page to submit questions. Um, how can the Digital Services Act protect EU citizens if U.S. safety measures allow its government to influence big tech companies? Well, I think that's a, that's a very good question uh, because there is a lot of back and forth with how far uh, goes the, the U.S. jurisdiction uh, when it comes to things that also happened in Europe. Uh, for instance, when it comes to data localization, uh, all of that. But it's for the companies to decide, do we want to have different services in different jurisdictions? And um, as said, I would find it a hard sell to say that we will only protect uh, children and minors within the European jurisdiction 
and not in the rest of the world. So I think there is room for coexistence uh, with uh, different obligations uh, for these gigantic companies. But it's partly a political argument, not just a legal one, right? It, indeed. Yeah. Um, how can young people who want to meaningfully participate in designing just and safe digital futures be most effective in speaking truth to power and moving the needle? I think that's a tricky question. Uh, because you want, if you want to speak to someone, you need to be somewhat on the same channel. And um, take the, the, I think, controversial discussion here about TikTok. Even though many, many, many young people are at TikTok and they find their news on TikTok, you still find that a lot of the politicians that they can soon vote for is, is not there. So one needs to figure out channels. Uh, I think Greta Thunberg, she was the one who really found one channel that worked, which was to say, I'm not going to school, I'm in front of the parliament every Friday in order for you to listen to our concerns about climate change. And I think that's the most important consideration if one has a message and want to, to uh, confront uh, representatives is to figure out what is actually the challenge, channel. And, uh, and sometimes the channel actually is real life in front of the parliament building. Um, is recognizing the threat, the existential threat of AI, a bit of a Pandora's box, uh, a threat that will only be recognized after it's out of the box? Well, some say that we will only know once we're there, and then obviously it's too late. Um, I have sort of listened to this idea about uh, over a cocktail, what is your P doom? I find that is taking it a bit uh, lightly. Now, uh, one of the things I'm considering is if it works as a bit of a decoy, think about the existential threats for the entire humanity. If you have existential threats for the individual, that because you're a minority, you will not be seen when you apply for university. Because you're a woman, you will not be able to get this mortgage or your symptoms are not being seen uh, in this sort of uh, medical use of, uh, of AI. So I think we can prevent a lot of the possible, maybe possible, long-term existential threats if we deal with technology right now and make it safe to use. So there's a real sense of urgency right now. Oh, that's a real sense of urgency. And this is why, you know, we started in, within the G7 so um, US, Japan, a couple of, of, uh, of European uh, countries last spring and by autumn uh, last year, so within six, seven months, we had the G7 Code of Conduct, uh, which addresses a number of these things. Of course, this is not legislation, but it is you know, heavyweight countries expressing what they think is, is the, uh, the way to go uh, when it comes to developing uh, artificial intelligence, and you said, obviously. Commissioner, this is a massive year for elections worldwide, Mexico, France, um, uh, India, uh, local elections in Brazil. What kinds of advice would you give in terms of regulation um, to avoid AI and deep fake manipulation during political campaigns? Well, I think it is indeed the, the biggest election year on the planet in history. Yeah. The largest number of people who potentially can, can go vote. I think that in, in there is this thing called the Munich Security Conference. And at that occasion, uh, 20 uh, big tech companies, they took, uh, they took uh, an, an obligation uh, to find ways to watermark deep fakes or for people to see that it is a deep fake that you're faced with. Uh, this is not the AI Act, it's not the G7 Code of Conduct, it's not the presidential order, but it's much better than nothing. So I think, that, of course, is part of the technological solution. Second, for journalists, for news organizations to invest in debunking what may be fake. And then for every one of us uh, to keep a healthy portion of skepticism if we see something that hmm, doesn't seem to be, you know, the Pope in a puffer jacket. Well, he looked cool, but would he have one? Sort of to have that kind of skepticism when we look at, uh, at what we're being presented with. And then, of course, the old school thing, well, an election year is also a very good opportunity to meet people in person. 
and talk about what we want for a society. The challenge is we have a cool pope and the puffer jacket looked exactly the shade of white that he would pick. Yeah, it was great. I, I, had, where can I get it was my first sort of thought. Um, two Europe specific questions. One is um, a lot of uh, big tech companies have their EU domicile in Ireland. Is Ireland too lenient in regulating data protection cases in the European Union? Well, Ireland is, um, they have been building up, so they are enforcing privacy for everyone uh, in Europe uh, with the companies that are headquartered in, in Ireland. And they have uh, really increased uh, their efforts, so they have many more resources. And um, because of the discussion about how Ireland was enforcing uh, common laws, uh, we have now the much more sort of hands-on take on the Digital Services Act, where the Commission will enforce on behalf of everybody uh, when it comes to very large online platforms. Um, is the AI Act coming too early when European companies are late in the AI race? Shouldn't the EU let them operate freely to, so that they can um, commit themselves and catch up in the strategic challenge? Oh, that's a clear no. <laughs> because the, the, the point of the AI Act is, is that when you put AI into use, you need to be careful. You know, in the innocent cases, it's quite nice to know that if, it, if it's a bot that you're talking with in customer service. Um, so it's not about innovation. It doesn't touch innovation, it doesn't touch research, you know, go. Uh, it touches when you put things into use. And be it a US company, a European company, a company from, from somewhere else, you're more than welcome to do business in Europe, but for everyone it counts that we want to be able to trust your technology. So it's definitely not a protectionist approach trying to either spur innovation by European companies or stifle innovation by American ones. No, 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 no. It's to say, well, listen, if you come and you want to present your health AI, then we would ask you to make sure that your data actually supports that it would be useful in this use case. Uh, both when you trained it, but also afterwards when you tested it, that you have had the necessary quality of your data for this actually to be useful. And I think everyone with a uh, symptom would appreciate that it's safe to use, no matter where the company was headquartered. Well, AI is already being used to deny medical claims in the US, which is becoming a huge issue. Is that a use case that this would protect against? It may be. I haven't heard of the specifics, so I, I cannot give you a clear answer. Yeah, some good articles in ProPublica yeah. and Stat about that. Um, if personal data is the fuel of our digital economy, why not have a European personal data pool or cooperative that's owned by European inhabitants and run by Europe? Well, in some areas we s sort of think about this. Uh, we are developing what we call sort of a uh, health data space. Health data is, is very precious, obviously, because they're very personal, but they're also very valuable when it comes to developing everything within health, that be drugs or uh, equipment or processes. So we're figuring out how for the individual to safely put your data to the use of a greater good uh, and trying to square the circle in making sure that I'm still protected. No one can see what are, yeah, what doesn't work anymore. Uh, and what can actually uh, be beneficial. So, so trying to make these data spaces and we have sort of the legal infrastructure for uh, data brokers, for them actually to check that things are good for those who actually want to use uh, the data. Can you say something about the growing doctrine of a right to privacy and the right to be forgotten? which you know, has come out of Europe, um, the right of others to know about the history of a person they're dealing with, but also the right to kind of not be online inadvertently. Well, I'm, I'm quite happy that, uh, that none of the sort of old school Kodak moments of my youth uh, is not online. And, and I think we should extend the same courtesy to all the youngsters these days who may not want their future employer to see what they did on a picture taken 10 years ago. By their parents. Maybe by the parents, maybe not by the parents. 
So I think it's, it's a way of also the right to say, well, there are different phases of my, my life and in my professional capacity, I don't think that uh, my future employers should be able to see everything that I did when I was young because I moved on and I think that is fair enough. Mm -hmm. And so you think that there should be a role, for example, to be able to ask companies to take down pictures or other identifying information from platforms? In other words, once you put something out there, it's not out there forever. Well, that is the point in, in the right to be forgotten. Yeah. Um, it is, they ask a lot of us. Anyone ever read the Facebook terms of service? <laughs> no, you should. Well, um, not a single hand. No, because they ask a lot of you to basically sort of give away everything that you put up online, uh, which is why I think that you actually still have in Europe a legal right to ask them to be forgotten. I think that shows what's, what society is about, that it's not just for a company to say, you sign up because it's very useful for you, and then I will then take whatever you put up there for my own benefit. Um, so a final question for you as we wrap up, Commissioner. Um, tell us a little bit about your own thoughts on digital usage. Have you, do you spend less time online than you once did? Do you have all the privacy, do you reject all the cookies? <laughs> and what should we as ordinary consumers be doing when it comes to our digital profile and our individual privacy? But yes, I, I go to my settings uh, also in general to reject cookies and I'm one of the once, I don't think we're not that many per million, who would reject cookies, who would do the scrolling and say, no, I don't want it. And the good thing is that it gives me time to think and I will not buy what I was looking for, which usually is a good thing. And the second thing is that I take the advice from my children. I have three daughters, 21, 25, 28, and they have a much better use of technology than I used to have. Mm. And they say, put it away, mom, not at the table, get a life. <laughs> Commissioner Margreta Vestager, thank you so much for sharing your insights with South, by, with South by Southwest. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.